Hear us squawk. On this episode of The Pine Talk, Ezra and Peter will share their stock of information to keep you up to date around the clock. I am Ezra, a young software enthusiast who loves floss, and I'm with... Peter, and I'm just a regular dude, and you may know me from my pine phone videos on YouTube. But Ezra did some too, right? So uh, I sure did. You may know of us both from YouTube. And the big question that we need to address in this introductory episode is, what is Pine Talk? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that website says something like it's uh, a podcast by the community for the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. So... It's not just us, it also is you. So we we are definitely going to need your feedback, your questions, and also your ideas. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, community participation is always a good thing, right? Yeah. So while it's just us two right now, uh, maybe we can uh, find a way later on to at least make a few episodes where we uh, where more people can join in there would be ways to do that using open source software and um, we'll certainly explore that but if you've got different ideas please share them with us no what's that email address it's a uh, pine talk at pine 64.org that's where you can where you can send your uh, questions and ideas there's also going to be a pine talk chat uh, channel on the Pine64 Discord server. It already exists, and there are some people in there. And uh, <laughs> while we oh, really, I was yeah, I haven't checked. It already exists. I'm I'm not a huge Discord user, so I actually mm -hmm. haven't spent a lot of time there. And oh, there's mm. already content about pine nuts, so that's pretty great. And some random wow. questions. And some people like were like, that. oh, Pine Talk seems like a misleading chat name because uh, one would mistake this for general chat, which is a good point. But um, let's just say the names for a podcast that you can actually choose turn out to be surprisingly limited every then and now. Yes. There was a different true. working title for this. <laughs> um <laughs> But that was already taken. Sadly. I thought it was a great one, too. But Pine Talk is... Pine Talk's okay. You'll make the best out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what choice do we have, right? <laughs> um, so let's uh, just do, do it and um, get into it. So what's generally planned is that we uh, will... Uh, go into the Pine64 community uh, uh, updates. Uh, we're not going to do this for this episode. This is introductions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you will know who we are, what our experiences with technology, broadly speaking, have been. Because, let's face it, the Pine64 community, at least I think, is mostly uh, about technology and uh, free libre open source software. Mm -hmm. It's about um, some ARM um, single board computers and uh, stuff you can build out of those, like phones or tablets or notebooks mm -hmm. or laptops, whatever you want to call those. Mm -hmm. And um, many, many uh, other projects, uh, products around that, like the Pine Time and so on. Mm -hmm. So what is Pine Talk? Well, it's going to be whatever you wish it to be. Maybe, not really. That's impossible, right? Because people are, I think, too different to achieve that. But we are going to try our best. Mm -hmm. 
And now let's do something that we are better at right now, and that is introduce ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, Ezra, I need to ask, what was your first computer? That's a really interesting question, because my very first computer I had, I have to say, when I was probably... Um, eight or something, eight to 10. It's, it's hard to remember exactly how old I was and what the year was, which would be 2008 to 2010. And it was a old used computer that had Linux pre-installed, which means my first computer was a Linux computer. And since I didn't have any previous computer experience before that point, I actually found it somewhat intuitive. It was running Ubuntu uh, with GNOME 2, and uh, it was back when the user interface was very brown. <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> those were the good days. Good old days. <laughs> and it made all those earthy noises, mm -hmm. you know, those system sounds. They yes. were like, boom, 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 like African drums. Yes, yes. Uh, it was an experience, to say the least. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I would say my first real computer I had a, a few years after that, which was a um, uh, some kind of pre-built or pre-parts chosen computer, which uh, my dad got me off of uh, New Egg, and we assembled it together <laughs> and made a whole activity about it together. But uh, that computer had Windows on it as uh, its operating system, but eventually got Linux in due time. What about you? What's what's your first computer? Well, it's tough to say because I I didn't have my own computer. I think uh, until I was about thirteen or fourteen or something like that, um, because my parents uh, weren't really into tech or computers at all. So the first computer I ever used was one of my parents. And that was um, some old Apple uh, Performer 600, I think. So it had, I don't know, some old Mac, a Motorola 68K processor at 32 megahertz and had like 4 megabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I ran System 7. Which was, well, I really liked it at, at that time, but uh, by today's standards, you would have to say that, well, it was okay for its time, but all in all, it was a terrible operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what I could use. And there were no games on that thing. That computer uh, must have been purchased around 1992. So that dates me because... Uh, I was already uh, seven in ninety or turned seven in nineteen ninety two. So, yeah, I'm quite old, um, <laughs> at least compared to Ezra. Yeah, I turned and... zero in two thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I turned fifteen in two thousand. Guess what? Yeah, and uh, um, so it didn't have any games. So I I really spent my time going through all those system preferences and. Uh, there was a semantic great works installed, which was some kind of well Microsoft uh, or well, you know Office clone, so some Office software, and I really went through every option in the menu of that software. Uh, so it's actually I think if I were to remember all that, it would still the software I'm likely best suited to use because I know it by heart. <laughs> Because when did I ever since do that? You know, I I mean, I, I edit my videos in KDN Live, but have I explored every option in the menu of mm -hmm. that software? Mm -hmm. Hell no. Of course not. And yeah, that was this Macintosh experience. And uh, my first computer I had then was something my parents gifted to me. And that must have been around, yeah, I don't know. 1999, 2000, uh, 
something like that. It was uh, Intel Pentium with 90 megahertz and 40 megabytes of RAM and 800 an 800 me- megabytes hard drive. Wow! So that that's by the way 10 times of what that Macintosh had. It had a 80 megabytes hard drive. Um, uh, that thing ran uh, Windows. Well, it didn't didn't have an operating system pre-installed, so I installed uh, Windows 98 because we had that lying around from another PC my parents had purchased previously. So I illegally reused that. <laughs> and uh, the good thing about that computer was that I uh, got to um, open it and tinker around with it. I uh, took it apart. I put in a CD-ROM drive because it didn't have one. I um, figured out how to uh, connect a keyboard because it didn't have a PS2 uh, a plugs, which were what you had previous to USB. It didn't have USB. It had some older uh, plug, and then I need uh, figured out how to get an adapter to connect the keyboard that I had bought mm-hmm. and so on. So I, I, I learned a lot uh, with that system by, well, sheer, I, I, you know, it's I, this computer, I really don't like it, but hey, it's my computer now, so I'm going to use the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. So that was my, my perspective. And then shortly later on, I uh, built my uh, first um, computer. I had saved some money and bought a motherboard uh, and uh, some AMD Duron uh, CPU and I don't know, some, some NVIDIA GeForce 2MX graphics card or something for, I don't know, like uh, about 500 bucks and uh, put that together and I had researched it well enough that it just worked Mm -hmm. and that was my my first computer and on that thing I actually ran Windows Mm -hmm. Uh, but I uh, had a big enough hard disk that I could also dual boot Linux I think back then it must have been either SUSE or Mandrake Mandrake uh, is something that lives in, in on in uh, Mandriva or open Mandriva today. And SUSE uh, back then uh, was something you could buy and there was a book in the box and it was a DVD with tons of software pre-installed and SUSE, of course, you may know open SUSE. So, mm. and both of those operating systems are actually on the Pine phone. But uh, yeah, so that was my my first experience with computers and Linux. That's very interesting. I I I could clarify that uh, my first computer had a AMD bulldozer in it. Uh, okay, I think is what they called it. I forget exactly. Yeah, it was something like that. And that processor ran excessively hot. <laughs> like I never ever turned on the heater. My computer was my heater. <laughs> Yeah, that that's how it was back then. <laughs> uh, I think my my Durons were pretty cool, but I I I remember that I switched CPUs rather quickly, and then there was a new one available, and I switched to a different mainboard because that had a slightly faster chipset, mm-hmm. and so on. Um, and I learned about that it really makes sense to run a CPU at a low multi- multiplier and with a high front side bus and so on because that improved the overall system performance and stuff like that. So that that was a ton of fun. And there was one uh, later uh, Duron CPU that I could then mod uh, using um, a pencil um, to become an Athlon. So you could unlock L2 cache via uh, connecting some disconnected uh, pins on the top of the process. <laughs> that was something um, that that worked then for a while and then it stopped working, so I had to go back, open the case, remove the fan, and uh, make sure that that, was, that stuff was connected again. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that hmm. was... And you you always had to test that then you know with mem test or something so that you were sure that uh, those disabled parts of that L two cache were actually uh, good and working and not broken. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
tell me, what was your first smartphone, Peter? Oh, my first smartphone, yeah. Um, my first smartphone actually ran Linux. Yeah. It wasn't my, my, my first phone didn't. My first phone was some, I don't know, Motorola C450. Mm -hmm. And my first smartphone, if you can call that a smartphone, because, <laughs> you know, they're... they're This, the definition of those early smartphones that's that were basically pre-iPhone is um, quite uh, yeah can be controversial. So th it was a Motorola uh, A seven hundred eighty. If you look that up, what that looked like, it looked ridiculous. Um, it was basically uh, like a tiny. Uh, personal digital assistant so it had a stylus and i think a 2.4 or 2.6 inch screen and that screen was behind uh, a, a clamshell on which there was a, a, a numeric keypad so you could dial without using that touch screen <laughs> it really looked strange this is really cool but actually. it ran linux <laughs> yeah it's It's so weird it's cool again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's what, what my first smartphone was. And the Linux it ran was, uh, well, yeah, Motorola hadn't uh, published a software development kit or something for it. So all you could do were some, some people had figured out how to build a couple uh, Qt apps for it. It was running, I think, some Qt embedded Monta Vista Linux Uh, with a Linux 2.4 kernel and so on, and uh, the real apps that you could install were some uh, J2ME uh, Java, Java Java mini apps for for phones, basically. Mm -hmm. That also ran on feature phones back in the day. Mm -hmm. That was around uh, 2007 that I got that thing, and um, yeah, I was quite happy with it. Although it really looked weird. <laughs> yeah. What was your first smartphone? <laughs> My first smartphone was nothing particularly special, but definitely something stressful. It, okay. The it Python. was. <laughs> it was. Uh, no, it was the um, Samsung A10, I think is the number. And. It's a decent Android phone that does Android phone stuff, and it's able to run everything you'd expect an Android phone to run. It can even do some uh, amount of advanced graphical like gaming things too. But uh, the stressful part came in with uh, the fact that I had to sign a contract to get it because the store that sold it to me sold in quotation marks there uh <laughs> didn't actually sell it to me but they just made me sign a contract that said that i'd eventually own it after a period of time um the reason i got a phone was so that i could uh more easily get a job because otherwise i don't actually have a phone a home phone yeah. there's there's no way to contact me professionally so i got the phone so that people could contact me so i could get a job and then the job would help pay for it uh but uh getting the job uh didn't always work in my favor i didn't always manage to get a job and even once i did yeah. it um it was really uh expensive and i had to jump through some hoops uh to to pay so to actually just kind of cancel the contract and purchase the phone and own it it was just overly okay. complicated well that sounds like like a bad experience but that a10 is fairly recent is it or have i found the wrong one on i think you no know, it's possible that you got it it is a fairly recent phone i've not owned a phone for a very large portion of of my life i've managed to get by without it yeah but uh I, I figured I figured eventually I'd want a phone anyways, so I just kind of picked the cheapest yeah. okay one. Not knowing about the world of phones. <laughs> And contracts. <laughs> yeah, contracts are tricky. Very, very I really, tricky. 
I have to say I, I bought that. Um, I didn't have a con phone contract. I was using um, pay-as-you-go cards mm. at the time. And I bought that Motorola A780 used. I bought mm -hmm. it on eBay, actually. Okay, what do we have next here? Single board computers. Well, yeah, my first single board computer uh, is totally surprising. Well, maybe it's surprising because this is the Pine Talk. Uh, it was a Raspberry Pi Model B. That's it. <laughs> the first Model B. So it has like those 512 megabytes of RAM and I still have it. Uh, but I don't use it currently. Hmm. I've been meaning to use it as a print server to put cups on it and so on, but I haven't uh, bothered yet. How about you? I have, I, I think mine's the same, if not like some kind of plus variant of the same one. I can't remember exactly which Raspberry Pi, but... Uh... But I also had a Raspberry Pi, although I am currently using it for for various assortments of uh, of work in progress projects. So you're you're still using that uh, original Pi? Yeah, exactly. It's been it's been a few years now, and uh, yeah, it, it's still useful, and I still got some things to experiment with it, and I still didn't break it. Yeah, mine, mine too. It's still still running strong. Um, yep, when I use it, <laughs> <laughs> it currently is just sitting in a box somewhere and waiting for its next uh, mission. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I uh, I have it. Uh, it's Great. been on for for a little bit now. I I have it connected. To, I have an SSH server running on it, so I can connect uh, anytime, yeah. and it's running on a. Uh, at a headless on a headlessly yeah i used mine for a while uh with, with a motorola laptop mm -hmm. motorola made for their atrix phone made made a laptop that worked with basically everything that you could uh plug into it which was well you needed some special cables but um you could just plug that stuff together and then it would work with the raspberry pi and i tried to use that to have a Raspberry Pi laptop, basically. And um, yeah, that was mm, not as fun as I had hoped it to be. <laughs> it was no. way slower than I would have thought and totally clunky because then if, if you weren't getting the timing right between switching on the, the Raspberry Pi and opening the laptop, then it wouldn't work. And, uh, it was fiddly. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, I I played with that for a while and then I actually got myself uh, an ARM laptop later on. But yeah, that was the first Samsung ARM Chromebook, but I don't have that anymore. Hmm. But yeah, I think that's a good segue to bring us to the next question we've got here. And that is, Ezra, what is your favorite Linux distribution? That is a good segue and a very good question. Hmm. It's uh, hard to say because I've definitely been somebody who distro hops or distro hopped in the past a lot. But recently I've been, uh, for about a year, been using Fedora and Fedora I'm enjoying very much. I enjoy the package manager. I find it interesting and enjoyable that the default option when you install something using uh, DNF is uh, is no. No is the default answer, which means if you're accidentally installing some things, you have to actively say, yes, that's what I want, instead of just smacking enter until the thing is done. <laughs> so it's... Um, that's what you enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, that's my my right. favorite my favorite part. <laughs> but uh no, I I enjoy it. it's it's um a much more stable than I had expected. I'm not sure why I, I thought it would be uh unstable, but people uh, online sometimes uh would kind of made me believe that it it was a bit unstable uh compared to something maybe like yeah. uh 
I don't know, not Fedora. <laughs> Ubuntu. But uh, b- before Debian. that, uh, yeah, CentOS. <laughs> CentOS. Uh, Debian is pretty stable, but uh, requires some heavy configuration. But I think they, I think uh, Debian has like the best way to describe their OS. They call it the universal operating system. Yeah. I think that's very true. Uh, Debian is designed not to be easy to use, but so that once it's all built together, that it, it, if you don't touch it, it should run just fine for seemingly ever. Otherwise. Yeah, that's true. Otherwise, uh, I enjoy Arch at a, uh, at a theoretical level <laughs> uh I, I never i never got it to installed properly although i i got somewhere close uh, i just never really took the time to to learn properly how how to install uh, arch but I, I do i do enjoy what it offers me which is the 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 chance to learn a lot about linux and give it a shot like i wouldn't necessarily use arch as a daily user, but I do love playing around with it and I can see how it could give somebody more options and freedoms, I guess, uh, if utilized properly, which is why I do enjoy a lot Manjaro. Like Manjaro is really up there as one of my personal favorite Linux distributions. So yeah, that would be my three in my top three. I would say you got Debian, Fedora and Manjaro slash Arch. Okay, great. What about uh, you? For me, it's it's actually not that dissimilar. Um, I really like Debian uh, running it headless on some system that I don't want to deal with ever so often that I just set up and then it's supposed to keep running. Uh, that's something I really enjoy doing. I've got a tiny home server here. It's... Uh, uh, another single board computer, a want board. So I don't know what I'm doing here, you know. And again, the single board computer, <laughs> not by Pine sixty four. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it has an IMX six processor, and I run Debian on it. Um, and you know, there are hard drives connected to it that I can then access remotely and so on. Yeah, just just boring stuff. Basically, but it just runs and runs and runs. And it's a solid OS, but I don't like it on the desktop at all. Mm-hmm. What I run on the desktop currently is I run Fedora, actually Fedora Workstation, with with GNOME on my um, mobile computer, my laptop. I enjoy that quite a lot because I've been upgrading it from, I don't know, three or four releases ago. We talked about that earlier and I'm not really sure. And it's been super solid. Nothing broke. And it feels so solidly engineered and it's also Mm -hmm. quite fast. Um, The only problem with Fedora still is stuff like, uh, I don't know, media codecs. You need to enable stuff like RPM Fusion for that. That's, uh, I would prefer that to be uh, in the main repos but i understand what the issue is so i'm fine with that mm-hmm. and then i'm also running uh, arch um i was lazy with my main machine here i didn't install it from stock i uh, chose endeavor os which is well basically a fancy arch installer if you want to call it that i don't know whether they would agree with it and um i'm also running arm linux on my secondary tiny uh, Chromebook laptop, which is an Asus C101P. Uh, and uh, I installed it there f- like you would install Arch Linux, you know, go through everything and configure it. Because that's, I think, a great way uh, to learn a lot about what you have installed on the system and which component does what mm-hmm. because uh, it helps you with that i mean of course there's this p- dependency m- management so you don't have to figure it out all on your own right it's not like going linux from scratch or something <laughs> yeah. but um it's quite nice and i've recently finally got around to 
building some uh, package build scripts to build my own packages because I've been previously when I installed software on my uh, tested software on Arch on my Pine phone because I already also run uh, Danknex mobile Arch Linux I'm on the Pine phone I, I previously just went you know okay what are the build instructions clone the git repo uh, meson meson blah blah build ninja bam ready uh, and I would totally clutter my, my system with that because you would then have to uninstall it manually and that means figuring out where did this program exactly put all those files <laughs> and how can I remove them all and that's <laughs> therefore I figured out package build scripts and they are so easy I could learn it in two days and mm -hmm. I'm not the fastest learner with stuff like that so um yeah that's that's really an advantage of arch but yeah fedora debian and i also use ubuntu every then and now but um i'm no more as fond of it as i were mm -hmm. if i had to pick one i would say arch mm -hmm. arch is definitely my favorite linux distribution but that doesn't mean i always prefer to run it in every <laughs> under every, every circumstance I find that agreeable. So next up is, what is our favorite PinePhone OS? Yeah, I think I already mentioned what mine is. So what about you? Mine is currently, it's one of the Manjaros. So I'd say Manjaro as a, as a general like operating system has been my favorite experience on the PinePhone so far. But I haven't tried Debian yet. So you haven't tried Mobian? I haven't tried Mobian. Yes, exactly. That's what they yeah. call it. <laughs> you should try that. It does seem very, very good. It's a good topic for a video currently, even though that the Mobian Community Edition is mm -hmm. on sale. Maybe people are looking for videos on that. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah, I'm not actually working on a Mobian video, uh, despite I should. If I were for out for those views you know um mobian definitely is really solid it's well, um, one of I, my favorite OSs. i'm suddenly oh. working on a debian video <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but uh, i i i really like uh arch linux arm mm -hmm. if i had to name a second favorite well, currently, I think it's really uh, Manjaro Plasma Mobile because it's quite fast and I've installed a build a couple of days ago and several updates went fine, no breakage. So that's good. But then I still have that feeling with Plasma Mobile that it's not yet quite there. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but that might just be a feeling, but it's fairly nice. And I'm also using uh, Plasma Desktop on on Endeavor OS, so um, I I also like those the general uh, KDE lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's very very interesting and and, and agreeable. I I mean, my favorite thing like about the Manjaro uh, on the Pine Phone in general is how. Uh, after installation how configurable it is yeah um I, I i i only managed to really compile um things like the easiest i only compiled things on manjaro so far successfully and it was the it was the easiest thing it was just like compiling on a desktop computer um and uh, i compiled yeah. uh, my my very own game engine to uh to give nice. it a shot um i i didn't uh i didn't manage to get the rendering engine working but i did get the networking and core of the game engine working and with that i was able to make a little app that uh, controlled my computer's mouse my desktop's mouse from the pine phone that was very very fun and, and that's nerdy and i like that i could do that all of that on my phone like just like that yeah yeah, it's come on, it's a proper Linux computer. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, right? 
but uh, I do I do like Manjaro Lomiri uh, with because that that gives it more of a phone feel. Like I find compared to most of the other desktop environments or whatever you'd call yeah. them, um, because like KDE looks a lot like like or Plasma looks a lot like uh, my, uh, Android, and yeah. Flash uh, Flash feels. Uh, barren in, in, in a sort of way but i also understand that obviously i would like it to be functional before uh before visually being aesthetically pleasing yeah the, my main my main grab with Fosh is that they combined uh the launcher with the multitasking yeah you know that that is one thing one screen half and half that's mm -hmm. i i really think that's not the best choice mm -hmm. uh, especially long term I mean it's fine if you've got a platform that has like four apps mm -hmm. or ten apps that works nicely but when I uh, went crazy and took that 128 gigabyte SD card and installed all those apps from source and had like I don't know <laughs> 90 <laughs> apps on my pine phone or maybe it were just 50 but tons of launchers yeah that really wasn't a great experience because you always only have that bottom half uh to scroll through all those apps once you've got one launched mm -hmm. <laughs> um but other than that i really like Fosh and the no mobile initiative i don't want to be uh, negative on that so it's just the Right, that I feel that that's not the best decision once you get to a ton of apps. Um, but otherwise, I think it's it's fine for now. And yeah, it looks like I, purism keeps developing it, so there's hope. I agree. I right. agree, and I, I'm sure they're going to find some easy solution. For all you know, they'll add a button and you press it, and they'll make the launcher be full screen. Yeah, or they could could introduce gestures, <laughs> uh, but but that would be really taking a page of Lomiri's playbook. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to tackle the next next question? <laughs> yes, we are, and I'll ask you: When did you first learn about Floss slash Linux slash just the whole free software movement? Yeah, and I that's a good question because I really had to think hard about that. Because I think I learned about it but didn't fully understand it uh before I had this first computer of mine. Uh it may have been because I really tried to consume as much information as I could so I, uh, there was first like computer uh, sh uh, shows about computers on the television <laughs> yeah and I think that that was when I first heard of Linux and open source sometime around I don't know maybe like 1997 1998 yeah that looked like nothing I would ever want to use back then mm -hmm. <laughs> it seemed great like a great idea but uh, it didn't really seem usable or user friendly, you know. I was growing up on Mac OS, and then there was this system that was, I don't know, mostly a command line interface. Uh, they had an X server back then, but those programs didn't exactly look nice, and uh, yeah, but it felt great that people would work together and mm -hmm. yeah but but that might may have been uh, a later discovery that this was people working together just for fun and for um, yeah let's have great stuff on our computers that everybody can use mm -hmm. but uh, once i grok that idea i was totally uh into a free liberal open source software and linux how mm -hmm. about you I had an interesting journey with it as well because uh, I, I also didn't fully understand when I first heard about it. 
uh, I think when people also just refer to it as open source, it does remove the whole like point of it where it's just like, oh, cool, you know, the code is available to everyone. That's nifty. And it kind of just stops there. Uh, I didn't understand at what scale, like what that could really mean for software. Uh, I know that I would say about, you know, like, let's say 2015, before I really started learning and enjoying Linux. Um, I actually did try to use Linux on uh, my computer, uh, but I had this, like, weird thought, and I'm not sure why I had this thought. I don't know if I'm the only one who had this thought, but I feel like I am. But I thought if I installed Linux on my computer, it would do a disservice to my computer, making make it run slower. And because I'm already somebody who doesn't necessarily have a whole ton of money, um, I wanted to make the most out of my, my purchase, out of my new computer. And I felt like installing Linux would have made my computer slower somehow. And it was just weird to go from that to now just using it full time and even things running faster on my computer. And I know Linux hasn't always been more efficient and that's not its goal either, but eventually just learning about Linux as time goes on, you, you're just like, you just learn thing after thing. You're like, wow, this is not just an idea, it's a movement. And I think, I think software, like a lot more software should be free and open source i think a lot of software could benefit now but before i didn't know it was hard to visualize like why you'd want something to be just open but i also didn't understand that you could be like the entire world collaborating on one project and even once i learned that it, it, it's just i don't know it's 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 an interesting thing to think about uh and I think I know it, I understand a little bit more now, but I feel like every day I learn more about Linux because now, nowadays everybody has a bit their own opinion on what Linux means to them and what free and open source means to them. A lot of people are starting to use Blender and they see it as a free product, not as an open source free product. So that's how I viewed it as well. Yeah. <laughs> So it took yeah, a while yeah, before it clicked. That's, that's common. I I, re I recall using GIMP and being like, yeah, that's great software. It costs nothing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I was like, when the next version came over, and I, I felt like, oh, yeah. Now that's not much different, but <laughs> this is working better now and that bug is fixed and oh, mm -hmm. I browsed, browsed the website a bit and so on, and then I figured out, yeah, okay, so that's all these people are working together to make this. Well, that's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure but whether and how I can ever com contribute to it, but I like this idea. This yeah, is really yeah. cool. Indeed, I, I agree. I like the community aspect of it. So even if though you're not a programmer, you can still give suggestions and whatnot. But I do also find that as I became more of a programmer, learning computer programming and stuff, I, I definitely got more interested in free software just from like the fact that I can personally learn from these very good, very well-written software. Uh, I Speaking of yeah. GIMP, though, I have a friend. <laughs> he, he installed Ubuntu on his computer just to use GIMP because he thought it was a Linux okay. thing. <laughs> So he could have installed that on Windows too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he went through that entire effort of just installing Linux to get GIMP just so he could add an alpha channel to a PNG image so he could like remove uh, <laughs> some colors and make them invisible. Channel. Yeah. It's very important to have translucency. Very important. I mean, that's some dedication for, for transparency, but I, I don't know. I found that very. Yeah. <laughs> A very enjoyable <laughs> story. I, I don't know, like how how that happens to someone, but I also know free software actually has been in my life a little earlier because when I was in school, like in primary school, the school computers they had 
video games on them for like free time or whatever. Okay. And all the games that they had, they were all free games that they could easily install. But like it had like Super Tux and it had Tux Paint and it had like GL Tron. Oh. Nice. And like I know that now when I played it, I was just like, oh, Tux, that's the cute penguin character. I, I love cute penguin character. Yeah. And it was fun to play a Mario type <laughs> game or whatever, or play around in in Tux Paint when you're when you're super young, and just I messed it around with the stamps and built some s- silly pictures or whatnot. But I was doing all of that on the school's, of course, Windows computers, and it was never told to me that these were like Linux or anything. And I just found it funny that teachers or whoever was in control of the computers thought that Tux games meant free games. You know, like yeah. monetarily free, and yeah, it, it's it, it, that. That's how I guess I was really introduced to it. And <laughs> it's funny because nobody knew why it was called Geltron. Mm. You know, it's just the word. It's just Geltron. Oh wow! You know, when you're like when you're like eight or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> don't I know. don't care. It's fun. Exactly. Oh, I I played that a lot too. GL Tron. Oh my god, I, I really need to go back to that. Yes. That was nice. Yeah. I mean I was like... way older then when I played it, but <laughs> I really liked it. Uh yeah. I and when you started talking I I first thought, oh, maybe they had uh Je Compris, you know, Je, Je Compris, uh that uh software uh-huh. install that's uh under the wings of the KDE project, but still starts with a G. This uh, educational software, yeah. but apparently not. They just had games. I like that elementary school. Very nice. <laughs> Who wants to know it stuff about water choice. and how the world works if they can play games? When did you first learn about the Pine sixty four project? Well, it was with the with the first Pine sixty four product, uh, the Pine sixty four. I think. Or Pine A64. I think maybe it was called the Pine A64, I think. Uh, which was, I think, a, felt like a crowdfunder. I don't know if it actually was, and I should have looked that up. But uh, I think that was around uh, 2016 or 2015, right? When Pine 64 started. But at that time, I already had this Raspberry Pi we talked about before, and I had just gotten, I think, a Banana Pi, because that. I had a zero ATA for, you know, connecting hard drive. And therefore I felt like, oh, I don't need another one of these. <laughs> so I didn't get one. Um, but a, a work colleague of mine was really excited and he, he got one. And I meant to ask him um, how it was, but I will have to follow up on that in a later episode of this podcast because I somehow forgot because, well, home office and you don't see people every day anymore and therefore you don't really unless you've got a reason to talk to them via uh, video conferencing you usually just don't currently and therefore I forgot that but yeah mm-hmm. so I know someone who had that first Pine 64 device <laughs> yeah how about you huh um, I'm not exactly sure when I first started hearing about Pine64 specifically, but oddly, I'd often just search for Linux phones. Also, oddly, I never found anything, even though plenty of Linux phones have existed throughout the last few years. Um, but I never found exactly what I was looking for until eventually uh, some personality... Some internet personality started talking about the um, the Pine 64 and the the Librem 5. I think I heard about the Librem 5 uh, first before I heard about Pine, and Pine was the was an attractive offer to me, being within my budget range. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, that was with specifically the Pine phone, so that would be the first product I heard from them, and from there. Uh, I saw that they had a bunch of other things that uh, seemed very interesting, like the Pine Tab, the Pine Time, uh, and their single board computers. Uh, 
it must have been someone like uh, maybe the Linux gamer or or some maybe Lunduke yeah. or something. I, I can't really remember who specifically. Yeah, that, that many of them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It was so one of them. <laughs> it was actually the Pine phone that brought you to Pine sixty four. Yeah, and exactly. I mean in a way that's that's yeah. true for me too. So I I followed what they were doing. Um, I almost uh, bought a Rock Pro when that came out. Because that felt like, oh, performance, I like it. <laughs> but again, I was thinking, do I really need this? And, you know, trying to be environmentally mm-hmm. conscious and therefore not buying tech product, mm-hmm. products is something that I try to do, but I constantly fail at. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> unluckily for Pine64, before the Pine phone, I always decided to hold off um, on their products, but I have to say that uh, with the Pine Phone and with the amazing progress that has happened since I received my Pine Phone mm-hmm. on June 9th, uh, 2020, uh, and this um, community that works together, and you can see the results of that, it's it's really amazing, and I'm looking forward to trying and using more uh, Pine64 product. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say uh, a lot of the Pine products kind of remind me of when Linux was starting, even though I wasn't really there. <laughs> well, the stories my elders have told me about the, the good old days of Linux. <laughs> they, um, you know, I, I hear that, it, you know, it, it wasn't really uh, an alternative, especially when it was like semi-functional and didn't have any apps, which is exactly what is happening with the Pine phone. You know, there is barely any software that works well on it, although a lot of the important ones are there. And every day there's more and more and more and it just becomes As better the maintainer and better. of Lin- linmop apps dot frama dot io, I must disagree. There's tons of software, <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, <laughs> generally, um, there could be more and there are many use cases people have where there's not an app that exists or if there's an app that exists, mm-hmm. it's not easy to install or otherwise tough mm-hmm. to set up. So, yeah, 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 you have you've got a point. <laughs> Continue, <laughs> please. In the general sense. It's a, it's a, it's fun to see things advanced. And I remember as well when I first started using my Pine phone in like it was two, 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 three months ago. I, I can't remember exactly. Um, but uh, I got the post market OS one and I got the Manjaro edition. Yeah. And they, they, uh, yeah, they, they started running um, smooth-ish when I was using them, but uh, I I can see through time that they're running better, that they're becoming more optimized, and they're utilizing more of the hardware. It's fun to see it grow, and like they said it themselves, I'm sure, but it's fun to have a phone that up- updates make the phone faster, not slower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's right. Uh, the more and more drivers are being mainlined, and code quality improves. Bugs are ironed out. Um, you know, I was perfectly fine before the display could even run at sixty hertz. With my Pine phone, I felt like, oh yeah, it's a Linux phone. Finally, I've been waiting years for this. <laughs> Literally years. Yeah. You know, I I I was a bit late. Uh, when that uh, Librem 5 crowdfunder happened. I only backed it in late mm-hmm. October. I think they had already made their goal by, back then, but uh, let's just say I didn't have that much money at the time. So I figured, uh, like, ah, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to uh, invest when it's sure that this actually happens. And that was 2017, and... I had been waiting for a true Linux phone. Um, even though I liked Android, well, at least since uh, the Snowden revelations. 
I was like, oh yeah, it would be nice mm -hmm. to have something that's really running truly open source software, mostly open firmware, and so on to get some sense of control again. Um, yes. And therefore, when when the Pine Phone came out and became available and was clear, okay, they're now shipping it. Um, well, I, I had originally ordered the Braveheart edition, but that one and German customs weren't exactly compatible, <laughs> so it didn't have uh, all the <laughs> certifications that those German customs officers want. Also, it arrived at German customs right during the pandemic, so uh, I did not, did never uh, receive that one. But um, sadly, but then when the you want to touch community edition was on sale, I think I bought it the first day or something. Because I didn't want to miss out on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's what really no, I... the excitement about those products we already have, right? <laughs> yeah. That brings us to our <laughs> last question we're going to discuss here now. Maybe there may be questions that you would like us to answer, so but then you will just have to ask them in the Discord. Uh, contact us on Twitter at TalkPine or via email pinetalk at pine64.org um, and the last question we are going to answer today in this episode is what future Pine64 product are we most excited about? You go first. Well, I think it's between two for me. Um... I'm very interested in the Pine Cube, funnily enough, because uh, I did look around and like home security, like like you know home, mostly open hardware and open software, uh, home security systems. Uh, I think are lacking, and it's I think it's enjoyable to see Pine uh, uh, do something that can help with that with the Pine Cube. Uh, at least take a few f steps towards that uh, that uh, direction, and that's well. Th th that's why I'm excited for it. I, I hope that it's going to be. Um, it seems like something that that's going to be fun to set up, and if it's uh, open, it means that it's it's going to be much more modifiable compared to uh, if you just get some off the shelf uh, home security camera system uh, today. You're not going to have you're going to have their system and that's it. And if there's something you don't like in their system, there's absolutely nothing you can do. I can imagine this pine cube having like different systems, different user interfaces for when you have set everything up to look at it and, and all that. So I'm excited to see where, uh, uh, how it develops and, and how well it works. I just hope the camera is going to be a little better than the one that's on the pine phone. <laughs> Isn't it the same module though? Well, um, I'm not sure. Hopefully somebody develops some AI yeah. uh, neural network thing that can make the image much yeah, better. Yeah, I mean, there there have been... I've, I've, uh, Martin Brahm has shown, I think, some... hope I'm not butchering the pronunciation here. Uh, you know, the Postmarket US developer and fellow podcaster at the Postmarket US podcast. Uh, he has um, actually managed to process images even more than they are in megapixels. And he's really gotten amazing results. So maybe that should work. And Good. I mean, if you're just using it as a security product, as long as you can roughly recognize that face and then maybe improve the raw image of that, it should be fine, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. It should do its job. Yeah. It should do its job. And, and if anything, I think it's a good stepping stone to something better. Someone has to be the first to do it. Yeah. And we can't always expect the first to be the best. Yeah, that's really the case. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But otherwise uh aside from the pine cube i'm also interested in the pine time since i've never really been much of a smart watch people but there's a few people that i've seen in my family and in the streets and on youtube that that have these smart watches and i'm like 
you know, it's a high tech thing and it looks cool and all that, but I don't even wear a regular watch half the time. So uh, I personally, in general, I'm not super interested in, in smart watches, but the Pine <laughs> Time, I kind of am interested in it. I like its simplistic rounded square design. And, you know, I don't need something to be too powerful. I'm not going to watch, like, YouTube videos on my watch, you know. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but, but you know, just something that, that's good enough that um, that I could, like, receive maybe a, a very important message and that my watch would notify me and I'd be like, oh, uh, Peter sent me a very important email. I should check that when, uh, when yeah. I get the chance. So I can just be <laughs> up to date. Check it least. on your watch. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can check it on my watch. You know, it's a it's just a nice to have general thing, and for the price that they're selling it right now, although not a final uh, build or anything, I mean, twenty bucks. Even if the final product was like forty bucks, that's like a really good yeah. price for a normal watch. You know? Yeah. Well, maybe forty dollars is a bit expensive, but you know, generally, it, it's not ridiculous. <laughs> I think, and and that's something that I'm. I, I think people. Buy yeah. way less smart watches for way more money. <laughs> you know, all those luxury yeah. products. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I mean, they're fancy, but uh, unnecessary, I would say, to have something any more powerful than a, than a, than a, a pine time, in my, in my opinion, for a smartwatch. For the phone, like, I could obviously, I could benefit from a stronger CPU in the pine phone. But um, for the most part, it's also about as powerful as I would that I would need it. I mean, like I said, my Android phone can can run like some three D high quality, realistic looking games. But I mean, if I want to do that, I can just do that on my desktop computer. You know? Yeah. I don't need a phone to be as powerful as that. I I, I like watching a YouTube video every so often on my Pine phone, though, which is why often I test that particular like ability uh in during most of my reviews um it's that uh as i i want to be able to watch a video when i when i get one just just you know sometimes i like watching a video but not on a watch a watch needs to tell me the time and tell me my notifications if it's smarter yeah and maybe tell me if somebody's breaking into my house you know just some important quick quick knowledge the actual product I'm most excited about is one that uh, is likely always uh, also to play a part in a future faster pine phone, and that is, um, well, in some way, you know, the Quartz 64 that was recently announced. And the particular part that I like about that thing and that really uh, got me excited because, you know, it's just, just a single board computer, right? Um, and that is that uh, they are going to um, have an, a 10-inch e-ink display available at the time those launch and that the Quartz 64 Model A will feature a dedicated e-ink panel interface capable of supporting a capacitive pen. Now, that, that is, is pretty cool. something... There is a project, a product I have, and it was uh, I was using it as a backdrop in my first videos. That remarkable paper tablet. Uh, so I've got something similar to this, but I would really prefer to be able to have a device that I can, yeah, install like some box standard Linux distribution on, and then try and somehow get a nice interface on that one that works with e-ink to mm -hmm. take yeah. my notes so i'm really excited for that as a future pro uh, project and when i i read this in the current announcement i was like oh my god <laughs> i need to save money for this <laughs> <laughs> because i'm pretty sure that the e-ink display is not going to be super cheap because these things are pricey mm. But yeah, mm -hmm. so we've both got products that we are excited about. And I hope you enjoyed this podcast, this first episode of Pine Talk. And please get the feedback in, get in touch, 
and uh, subscribe to the feed. Uh, you're going to be able to listen to this on Spotify and on, on YouTube. But I personally believe that the best way to listen to podcast is using some uh, RSS capable uh, app like, uh, I don't know, Gnome Podcasts or G Potter. And uh, you can do that on your Pine phones, for example. Or if you don't have a Pine phone, you can use it on your Android phone with Antenna Pod or whatever. And uh, uh, steer safe of those platforms and just use those th these open web standards because uh, those are the best. Yes. Remember that we have our own personal YouTube channels that you can uh, check out for more Pine-related content. I am available. Uh, my YouTube channel is Electronion on YouTube and Odyssey and LinMob for Peter's stuff, which is much more uh, intimate and real-time. And he has some very interesting experiments that he uh, he has partaked in. I suggest watching his video about installing a OS to the Pine phone from a Pine phone. It's very enjoyable. And with that, we hope that you enjoyed this po first episode of the podcast and that you'll stay tuned for some more, more of us, more stuff, more Pine talky stuff. So thank you for listening and hear you in the next one in roughly two weeks. Bye. Thank you.